Okay. I don't know if I should sing or preach the, this morning here. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it, it's good to be back with you all again and, and uh, uh, share a little bit this morning about Dean, what's been going on. You know, I didn't mention that Dean's revival of Pastor Jeremy's church. They had 75 boxes go out, and, and that's that postage is expensive. And then we had uh, about $800 come in for Bibles, so we figured it was close to close to just just under $5,000 that came in towards the ministry to get the Bibles. Out. And I thank God for that. Uh, yeah. You know, despite all the evil in this world and all the wickedness and ungodliness, you know. Uh, we're supposed to be occupying and, and, and being busy while we're still here, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I just want to, I try to, I try to just uh, let those things go over my head, and I just try to just keep going forward for the Lord, just keep plucking away, plucking away, because that's our calling, isn't it? And I find out, despite all the evil that's going on, the wars and political correctness and sodomy and, and the government going bad, uh, no, nothing's stopping me. I, I can still preach. I can still drive. I can still say what I want to say. I can still go soul winning. And I can still win souls. And and I still correct people on the checkout lines, you know, if they're living wrong or something. As long as they're not bigger than me, you know. And and, uh, and, and still can do that. I, I didn't know, but last, last week I was preaching Sunday morning. I mentioned something about the sodomites just for about a minute, you know. And here there was one in the church that visited that morning. And the pastor told me later, he said, man, you said, you said it just right, you know. So I'm glad. And uh, because that person didn't come back. But you know, the truth is the truth, isn't it? And it's amazing how people will go so far to justify their sin. They'll go so far, they'll be absurd in trying to justify it. But, uh, but wrong is always wrong. But anyways, uh, so anyways, uh, We'll just get started with today's sermon, I guess, and let's turn to Psalms uh, uh, 34. I guess I'll just put this aside. It's kind of awkward, you know. <laughs> I'll just hold it like this and use this up here. And, uh, Candace comes up, she'll have to slide the bench back, and, and uh, we'll get along just right. Let me see here. Do I have some reading glasses down there? Huh? Yeah. Oh, man, you guys trying to hide it. <laughs> okay. Now, sometimes, I could read it right about here, you know, but I thought I'd just hold it a little closer. Now this psalm here, uh, you know, Sunday school, we talked about convictions. We talked about Saul when he uh, had a chance to cut off, or David when he had a chance to cut off uh, part of Saul's skirt and, and kill Saul. He, he didn't do it because of his conviction. And that took place in that wilderness of En Gedi. And I want to preach about the wilderness of En Gedi today because I got to actually see the place when I was over there. I got to see the cave that uh, these events took place in. So, so uh, I thought, and you know, that makes it kind of special, because like, just like you say, yeah, I've been to Palm and Tuming, I know, I've seen the carp, you know, everybody fed them. <laughs> well, you tell somebody in another country, and they just listen to you, but it's something special when you've been there. And, and so, uh, but here, uh, this all takes place in the wilderness of En Gedi, and this psalm, you know, it's a time when, when David uh, uh, changes behavior for Abimelech, and that took place during that time in the wilderness because he got tired of running. And he went over to the land of Philistine, and he came back. But but uh, overall, this is that period of his life when he was on the run, 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 and that was over in, in that wilderness. In verse one, here's what he says that he goes through these hard times. He says, uh, verse one, it says, "I will bless the Lord at all times; His praise shall continually be in my mouth." My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. 
O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Let's have a word of prayer. Well, Father God, I just ask you to bless this morning's sermon. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you speak to hearts and that your Holy Spirit has free range with, with, with uh, the, the hearts of, of folks here. And that the Word of God does, does a work that you intend for it to do. And if someone's unsaved, I pray they'll come to know Christ as their Savior. And I pray, Lord, that no one grieves your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this, this uh, uh, let me get these lights on here, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, this, this uh, passage here takes place, this uh, Psalm 34 takes place at a time in David's life when, when he was on the run, and he's out there in that wilderness of Engedi, and I was sharing with you how I got to see that uh, when I was over there in Israel. And, you know, a lot of people, they like to see Jerusalem and the city and the houses and the temples. But uh, me being an outdoorsman, I, I like the, the countryside a little bit better. I like seeing uh, some of these events that took place in, in other parts of, uh, of Israel. And, I, and that wilderness was a pretty special place to see. You know, it was a, a dry, rugged wilderness. And, and uh, it was hot. And a, a kind of a pretty rough place to be living in. It had many natural caves. And it had these cliffs that would rise from nowhere up to about 2,000 feet all at once. And, and real rugged, jagged rocks everywhere. You know, uh, if, you, if you was to fall somewhere, you could really cut yourself. Because, you know, it isn't like here in, in Pennsylvania where, where you go up at our mountains here and you have boulders. And they're, they're kind of smooth old boulders. No, the, the wilderness of Engedi, they, they didn't have nice smooth boulders. They had rugged, sharp rocks and cliffs everywhere. And, and so uh, it was just, uh, you know, you, you could, uh, and had many natural caves. That's another thing about the whole land of Israel, but especially in that wilderness of Engedi. So a lot of places for a criminal to hide out or anybody to hide out. And, and this became David's home for, for about seven years of his life. And, and, uh, and you know, as you were there, there was a, a certain empty, desolate beauty about the whole thing. Uh, it was fun, kind of fun hiking around in it, but at any time all I had to do was, you know, I was never more than an hour away from the big travel uh, uh, bus. I could always go there and there's air conditioning and some soft drinks and candy bars waiting for you. But try to imagine uh, living in a place like that. that, that would have been a pretty rough thing to do. And, and, uh, and David here now, the thing about David, you know, we read about David's life. And, and David was an unknown shepherd boy, okay, at one time. And, and, and then he goes from being an unknown shepherd boy to all, all of a sudden he becomes a national champion in, in Israel because he, he kills uh, Goliath. And, 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 uh, and so he goes from being a nobody to being famous just, just overnight. And, and now he's living in the courts of Jerusalem. That was a real honor, you know, to, to live there. You had, you had some... Uh, more, more conveniences there, and, and, and it was a little cooler there, and they had more green trees and, and, and things. And, and uh, so he, he goes from uh, uh, being a shepherd boy to being a national hero, and then he gets to get married to the king's daughter. That was a real honor, too, there. And, and, uh, and that was uh, Michael, and, and of course he loves her, and I'm sure she was a, a beautiful girl, so that was a plus, wasn't it? Anyways... And so uh, David, uh, he, he goes through these things, and, and he's enjoying himself. And, 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 then, and then all of a sudden, Saul comes along and gets jealous of, of David. And, and you know, uh, he accused him of being a traitor. And, and now, now he's banished from the courts of Jerusalem. And now Saul's seeking his life. And, and now David's life, is, he's just on the run. And, and uh, he's not just running because of some little trouble here and there. He's running for his life. And day after day, he's on the run, running, running, and running. You know, a person gets tired running for his life all the time. It's one thing to be on a run because you've been in trouble and your own fault, but to be running and being falsely accused of being a traitor and, and, uh, and they're after your life, it gets, it gets discouraging. And in his discouragement, he made a few bad moves. He went over to the land of the Philistines. He ended up in the land of Gath for a little while. And... and uh, but what a place to go, you know, a place where, where he killed their champion, Goliath. That, you know, he, he one time, 
Remember, he changed his behavior before Abimelech and because he had to cover up. You know, he tried to act like he was crazy because he, he, he left the frying pan of the wilderness and went to the fire itself over there in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Philistine land. And, and uh, it was just a rough time for him. You know, uh, you know, when things are going wrong for us, that's no time to be making decisions. Because nine times out of ten, we won't make good decisions when we're kind of on the run. When, when our mind is, isn't, a, isn't in control of ourselves, you know, people make rash decisions. Oh, I'll get even. I'll just do this. I'll just do that. And they end up in worse trouble. Uh, there's times that we just need to sit back and, and not make any decisions. And just wait on the Lord. There's times when it's, we might have to just let someone else take control of our life. And let them make the decisions for us. And, and, uh, and we got to be careful about that. But for David, he, uh, he's on the run from Saul. And things didn't go well for him. And, and uh, banished from the courts of Jerusalem. And Saul himself, you know, because of jealousy, he, uh, he comes after David trying to destroy him. You know, uh, jealousy sure does uh, breed a lot of other kind of sins in our lives. I mean, you let a little jealousy in, and before you know it, it just breeds, it just opens the doors for a whole bunch of other sins. And, and then we get deeper and deeper into our sin, and, and many times we, 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 hurt so, we hurt so many people around us. Boy, uh, jealousy can undo a lot of folks, and, and we got to be careful that we don't let jealousy in our lives. Uh, Saul let it into his life, and, and uh, I believe that was one of the things that pretty much destroyed him all the way through. Always jealous about this and that, always wanting to be the, the head guy that, and, and not share nothing with nobody else. But, uh, but it caused a lot of mischief. And, and David, for seven years of his life, he was on the run. He was about 24 years of old, year years old when... Uh, he uh, got into this uh, situation when he started running and hiding in the wilderness of Engedi. And as we hiked around there and saw those big old sharp rocks, and, and you know, David and his men could be up on a cliff here, and they could be shouting down to the saw on them. And it'd take them a good two hours to climb those sharp, jagged cliffs. Maybe there's a Pennsylvania mountain, they can get up there real quick. But in those, those, uh, in those, uh, those cliffs that were, were tall and sharp, it was kind of rough. And and, uh, and so they're playing cat and mouse, and and uh, David's on the run, and and and, uh, and you know he had plans for his life, I'm sure, and, and you know, but now his plans are kind of messed up. I'm sure, uh, you know, he had plans for his marriage with Michael. I'm sure he had plans to have raise a family and have children with her, but then his life was turned upside down, and, and and now he he he's got the government after him of all the resources. And, and, uh, and he's living like a criminal. And in the middle of all that, if you look down in verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and uh, blessed is the man that trusteth in him. But how, you know, I, was, I wondered, how could he say that God was good in the midst of his worst trial? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, it seems to me like, David, uh, things aren't, there's nothing good in your life right now. Your life is a mess. And yet, uh, he makes that statement. And, and uh, But you know, David was, was a man that lived by faith. And for us, we kind of know the rest of the story. We go ahead and read in the scriptures, and we find out that uh, this in Getty, in David's life, this trial in his life, these hardships, was all just a, a plan of God for David, working things out for good. Because God was preparing him to be a king in that wilderness. And, and, uh, and you, know, you know, he could have got a liberal education somewhere. Maybe he went to Egypt and learned a little bit about communism and political correctness and, and things like that. You know, he could have learned how to, you know, run the country the way the world does. But, you know, this country that he uh, was to be king over, it wasn't just any old country, it was God's country, it was God's people, it was God's heritage. And, and so the king that was going to rule in a righteous way, he had to be a special king with a special education. And God, who knows best, he knew how to prepare David to be that king. And so he took him to the backside of the desert. 
And there he trained them to be the next king of Israel. And this is what Engedi was all about. It was a training ground for, for David. That uh, God was uh, preparing him. And, and, and you know, over there in Engedi, he learned things. Like he learned about uh, 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 patience while he was in that wilderness. And, and God put into him character as he was in that wilderness. And, and one thing he really learned was was uh, uh, he learned uh, submission to the will of God. Now that's a pretty hard thing to learn, but you know that sure is an awfully good thing to learn, to learn to submit ourselves to the will of God. Find me a color here. And, and, and you know, how are you going to learn how to submit yourself to the will of God? How would you train yourself to do something like that? I don't think there is any, any such training for something like that. I guess the only way to learn how to do that is to, uh, you know, I don't have the color I'm looking for. Okay, here's a piece. A little intermission there. But anyways, uh, if you're going to learn to, how are you going to learn to have to submit yourself to the will of God? Now, isn't that a good quality to learn, submission to the will of God? But how are you going to learn that? You're not going to learn it from a textbook. I guess you learn it from trials, don't you? We learn from hardships and, and patience. You know, I don't learn patience by when things are going well for me. I learn patience when things don't go well for me. And and, and for David, uh, that's what God did. He prepared this, this wilderness and, and, and prepared these things in his life so he would be a good king. And and, uh, and then Gedi was a place of preparation. And so in our lives... You ask the question, you know, uh, when things go wrong and there's trials and, and, and things are turned upside down and our dreams seem to be crushed, we, we ask ourselves, you know, how do we, how do we uh, determine what is good during our, our hard trials? How do we determine God's goodness in the bad times? I mean, no one likes heartaches. No one likes... Uh, like David, his dream was, was turned upside down. His dreams of uh, of being married it was turned upside down. His dreams of having children with, with Michael it was uh, dashed because of, because of Saul. And, and so, how can you say God's good in, in times like that, when we go through situations like that? How about we uh, get that bad news from the doctors? How about when... Uh, uh, we're sick. No one likes being sick. No one likes... How about when we lose our job and have financial problems? How can we say that God is good? And and, uh, and so... And yet the Bible says He's good, doesn't it? You know, the Word of God says that all things work together for good and then the love of God are called according to His purpose. But I'm sure you all had times like I have when you have to say, Boy, Lord, how can you be good right now? I don't understand it. This seems awfully bad to me. You know, what good can possibly come out of this? And then you get that 23rd Psalm that says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You know, I, I know God's word's true, but, but Lord, how about right now? How can I say that a goodness and mercy is following me right now? It just doesn't seem that way. And, and, and these heartaches and, and that dream that was crushed. It's forever gone, Lord. I'll, I'll never have that dream back again. And these young couples, they, they start out their marriage, and and, uh, and many of them, they start out with these big high dreams and ideals, and they say, oh, we're not going to be like mom and dad and the other folks in the church that had these problems. No, we're going to have the best marriage. We're never going to argue or fight, right, honey? Oh, right, right. And, and, and our kids are going to be the best kids in the world, and they're going to be pure and clean and and we're never going to let them get a blemish on them. And, 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 uh, and they have these high ideals. And it doesn't take long for those kids to turn out to be stinkers, huh? <laughs> it doesn't take long before uh, you and your honey have an argument. And it doesn't take long before some trial comes along, some tragedy, some heartache that just changes your plans. And now the hopes and dreams that you have... They're not going to come to pass because this has come up. Some kind of sickness, some kind of a heartache, some kind of a tragedy that you didn't expect. And then you say, how can God be good at a time like that? You know, uh, 
we had a couple in our church down there in, in uh, Mississippi, and, and uh, this this young guy and, 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 and this young girl were just outstanding members in the church, and everybody liked them, and she was always busy doing things for the Lord, teaching Sunday school, and he, he was too, working with the buses, and they were both soul winners, and, and, uh, and, and then when they decided to get married, well, everybody was just happy about that. And, and they get married, and and then they decided that they wanted to have children, but they couldn't have children. They just, you know, she, they tried, tried, and and, uh, and so folks are praying about it. And then one day, uh, she ends up getting pregnant, and and, and you know, they go to the doctor and finds out that she's got twin girls inside of her. And everybody's rejoicing, and, and everybody's happy about it. And and then uh, about the time when she was expecting, I guess. Uh, what happened was uh, she had some difficulties that one night, and so so she goes to the emergency room, and you know how those emergency doctors are, you know, they, they get this education in a box of Cracker Jacks. I said that one time to an emergency doctor in the room, you know, he gave me a frown, you know. But you all know what I mean. You know, a lot of times, they're, sometimes they're just the worst things you want to go see. And, and uh, and, they, and he checks her heart and her blood pressure and says, oh, you're fine, just go home. And, but she knew something was wrong. And, and, uh, and then later in the night, she comes back into the doctor's the emergency room and, and she ends up losing her twins because of some negligence at the hospital. And you say, how can God be good at a time like that? How can he be good? What kind of measuring stick should I use? Because I... The Bible says he's good, but boy, I, I tell you what, it doesn't seem like it all the time. But you know what's kind of neat? The Word of God's got answers for everything, doesn't it? It really does if you search the Scriptures and really know it. And I want you all to see here in the book of Isaiah. Let's turn to Isaiah here, chapter 55. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. He says, uh, says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And, and I like what he says here. My thoughts aren't yours. My, my thoughts are, 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 you know, are as high as the heavens. They're much higher than the earth. You know, they're higher than your ways. And God is so far above us that uh, we've got to learn to just trust God with what goes on in our lives. Goes on in our lives. You know, we're 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 not infinite like God. We're not all knowing like God. And we can take things and, and, and not understand. And that's we don't see the beginning of all things, and we don't know the end of all things. We just live here now, and that's it. But God knows so much more. And and. Uh, and there's things that he can never really explain to us in human terms because we're just not able to understand it. Like, like for example, I mean, you know, you, you talk about God's love, you can talk about it for eternity. And, 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 the many, and like in John 3, 16, it says, and it talks about the love of God that, that uh, gave his only begotten son. It calls it, the, 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 it says that God so loved the world. And that's so, you know, you use it to describe something that's undescribable. Because God can't, in human terms, really describe His love to us right now, this part of our existence, and so He just kind of says that He so loved the world. You know, it's like like you parents, your kids ask you, "Why, mommy? Why, daddy?" Well, you can't tell them all the answers. There's no way they can even begin to comprehend some things, and so you just give them a, an answer that kind of satisfies them. Like me, when I was a little kid, and I'm asking about babies, you know. And when my mother said the angels bring them, that satisfied me. I couldn't begin to understand that. In fact, in grade school, when they were talking about it, and one of the girls said, oh, it came from an egg, the babies. I laughed her to scorn, you know. And the teacher said, what the way are you laughing for? I said, oh, you know angels don't come from an egg. I mean, babies don't come from an egg. They come from angels, you know. Because my mother said so. And, and, and so, so God... There's things that he can't adequately explain to us in human terms. And so what he does, he wants us to just have faith in what he has, has to say. And, and uh, 
You know, I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, I used to think that, well, I used to think my mom and dad were pretty mean. And I think we all can say we had some mean parents at times because we didn't understand their ways, did we? I mean, I, I used to like eating, eating uh, candy and, and sh sugar pops and, and, and things. I didn't want to eat those meat and potatoes all the time. Man, that was boring, you know? And, and I remember uh, my mom would have those meat and potatoes out there and, and, uh, and she'd have them on the table and, and, and you had to eat a little bit of everything. That was the rule back then. You know, she wasn't like mothers today. It says, you don't want to eat anything that's good for you? Well, here, have some candy then. <laughs> and, you know, and you know why mothers do that, don't you? Because they love themselves more than their own children. It's a selfish love. They want their acceptance rather than what's good for them. But I had that kind of mother and dad that were sacrificial. And they were going to do for me what was good for me, whether I liked it or not. And I can remember... I had to have a, have a bite of everything on that table. If there was asparagus, I had to have a bite of asparagus. And if there was tomatoes, I didn't like that. I had to have a bite of that. I had to have a bite of cucumber and a bite of lettuce and, and all those things before I could eat the things I liked, like the french fries or something. <laughs> and I can remember me and my brother, we would just, real quick, all the things we hated, there was no, no, no way around it. So we just stuffed them down real quick. Okay, we got them down now. Then we'd sit and enjoy the things we liked, and then we got our dessert as a reward, you know. <laughs> but uh, not my mom was me. I don't understand. Didn't understand that she was thinking of my health. Couldn't comprehend that. I was just a kid. You know, she talked to me about building strong bones and, and things like that. And I just looked at her. What are you talking about? You know? <laughs> the candy didn't bother me. And it doesn't bother little kids. It really does. You know how it makes you kind of feel yucky if you eat too much of something sweet? Little kids don't phase them a bit. And, and then, and then uh, I can remember the chores we had to do. And, and, uh, and, then, and then I had to do chores for all the neighbor ladies, the widow ladies, you know. I had to go take out their ashes every spring. You know, they had all them uh, coal furnaces. And I can remember uh, having to haul the ashes out. And everything's hilly where I live. And... and uh, and, and, and I'd be carrying that big whirl whirl all them heavy ashes down to the woods and, and sometimes I'd spill them on the ground and I had to shovel all back up. And my buddies are all just out there playing and having a good old time. They didn't have to do chores like that. And my mom would tell me, well, God's going to bless you someday for all these things. And I don't believe God ever blessed me for those things. Because <laughs> uh, I remember and complain so much, you know. And, and uh, but, but you know, I thought they were mean parents. But, but uh, you know they weren't mean, don't you? I remember when I was a teenager, the James Bond movies came out. And my buddies were going to see them. And, and, uh, and they're telling me about all the beautiful girls in the James Bond movies. And they're just saying, oh, man, right, you should see them. And, and this and that and this. And I said, oh, man, I'd like to see these beautiful girls. Because uh, I guess I've never seen any in school, you know. I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, but anyways, so, uh, so I go, Mom, I want to go to the movies, and we're going to go. You know how Mom's always checking on me. What are you going to do? And, and I said, I'm going to go see James Bond, and she wouldn't let me go. And the Catholic newspaper said that that was one of the ones on the list that you weren't allowed to see. And, and I wasn't allowed to see it. And, and boy, talk about a mean parent. All the other kids were allowed, but I wasn't. And, and, uh, and I remember one time... I, 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 I was so upset that I just, you know, we used to sass all the time because we weren't a Christian family. And I said, oh, Mom, you're just the meanest mom in the whole world. And boy, she just grabbed me by my shirt thing and put my face in front of hers. And she said, listen here, Buster. And I knew I was in trouble. And, she, and here's what she said. I remember the words that I didn't understand them at all. But she says, I'm not raised. She says, uh, she says, I'm, and she said, you can call me mean all you want, but I'm raising you for your future. So when you're 30 years old, you're not going to be made out of candy and sugar and potato chips like your buddy. You're going to be made out of meat and potatoes and have strong bones. You're going to have character. You're going to be a worker. And you're going to be a, 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 a head taller than all your, your peers when you're 30 years old. And, and you know, you know, she's going to raise you to be, be something. And, and I had no idea what she was talking about, you know. <laughs> 
But you know what? I, now that I grow up, I, I see what she was talking about. And you know what? She, she reminded me of Christ. Because that's the way the Lord is, isn't He? He wants to raise us up and prepare us and get us ready for heaven. And, and, and you know, He says the trying of our faith is more precious than gold. And, and so... And so he's not going to spare us uh, any heartaches. In other words, it may hurt, it may not be fun, but uh, but if it's good for us and if it's right, he's going to he's going to work that into our lives. And 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 my mother was like that. And, that, and you know, when your parents are Christ-like, it helps you relate to Christ. When you have a strong dad in the home, it helps you relate to the things of God. And I thank God for my mother. And I'm glad that. Uh, she uh, stuck by the stuff, and and and, uh, and, and, uh, and you know when I did get older, I did thank her for those things, because uh, just natural to do it by then. But you see, uh, uh, that's the way God is working in our lives. There's things that, that goes on that we can't understand, and and we get disappointed by it. But you know, uh, but God's working something out for for our, our betterment, and and we who are living by faith need to just trust God. And trust that uh, all things are, are working out for good. Now, he knows not only the beginning of things, but he knows the end. He knows what he has prepared for my life. He knows what's, what he's got prepared for my future. He knows my, my, my deathbed. He knows, he knows when I'm going to be on that deathbed. And, and so, uh, who am I to question God and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and tell him that he doesn't know his business? He knows what's best all the time. Just, 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 you know, God has our whole lives planned out, every inch of it. From the time we're a little child to the time we're, we're ready for, for the grave, He's got it all planned out. You know, the ministry I have today, I couldn't have done it 15 years ago. I really couldn't have. And, and all the all those years, God has prepared me. He has prepared me on those mission trips that I was on. And, and He prepared me as a child growing up and all those values my mom was trying to instill into me. And I didn't understand them. And and, uh, and all the trials that just come along, God was just always preparing, preparing us for, for the next step in our lives. And, and I think, and, and you know, after we've been through so many trials and we see what God's doing, like David, we can see God working. And David, years later, after coming out of that wilderness of En Gedi and God making him a king, he can look back and say, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He was good to me the whole time I was there. And, and, and maybe he didn't understand it all back then, but he could say God was good to him. And, and, and you know, there's nothing bad in our lives. Nothing. You know, we, we serve a God that there is no badness in him. He's perfectly good. And, and, and what he's a... And so when things come our way, we may not understand it, but we have to start going by faith and faith always will tell us that God's in control. You know, I'm not supposed to live by sight. If I live by sight, I'll get discouraged in no time. And I'll say, oh, things aren't fair. But uh, we don't live by sight. We live by faith. And, and faith is able to see through the trials of life. You know, this world's turned upside down, and we see our government going bad, and we see the dark cloud of evil taking over this whole earth. But, you know, if we live, look through the eyes of faith, Things will start making sense. And so so, so I've got to walk by faith and not by sight. And I've got to be able to say, yes, the Lord is good. And, and you know, he goes on to say, blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And, and, uh, and God wants you, all of us to learn to just trust him in the trials of our life. Just trust him. You know, there, there, there's, I think about Joseph's life. You know, the Bible's full of guys like David. You know, Joseph, that day he went out to, to serve God, I mean serve his dad, and his dad says, I want you to go check on your brother. And he goes out there, and, and uh, he couldn't find him. And, but then he found that certain man, didn't he? And, and that certain man said, yeah, I know where your brother are at. They're over yonder. And he goes over yonder and finds him. And what did they do? They threw him in that pit, didn't they? And from that moment on, his life was upside down. And this innocent guy, this innocent Joseph, gets sold as a slave. And he ends up in Egypt on an auction block, you know, for as a public spectacle. And he's sold. And, and uh, 
And then for 13 years, his life is, is turned upside down. And you say, well, well, was God good in that? Well, I'll tell you what David said about all that. At the end of those, those uh, 13 years, when God raised him up to be next to Pharaoh in all the land of Egypt, Joseph was able to say, yeah, you all meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. And what, what a statement to make after all those trials. And somewhere along the line, David knew God was with him because you never find him getting bitter. You never find him complaining or murmuring. He, he somehow learned to just trust God and by faith see that, that uh, God was working in his life. Couldn't understand everything, but there's a lot of things we don't understand. But I've got to take God's word. When he says he was perfectly good, that, uh, and, and that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, when those bad tidings come my way, and I don't like them, I've got to just trust God. Just trust God. Uh, you know, uh, there's no mistakes with God's with God's uh, goodness. You know, you know that that's one of His attributes, the goodness of God. And and as one of His attributes, uh, He's perfectly good. There's no badness in God's perfect goodness. Just like his, his, his righteousness, he's perfectly righteous. There's no wrongness in his righteousness. And, and, and his justice, he's perfectly just. And, and he's perfectly loving. And he's perfectly good. And, and so when things don't go my way and I don't understand it, I've got to just trust that God, God, God has a, a plan. And, and somewhere along the line, uh, things are going to be working out for good. And, and uh, you know, there's no mistakes with God's goodness. There's no such thing as bad luck. Not in a world that's governed by God. Psalms 34, or Psalms 37, he says that, uh, that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And what the Bible teaches is, is uh, he's so governing our lives that it's like we're always in a box. And he orders the steps of our lives. You know, he orders every every step. And there's nothing's going to happen by chance. You know, you, you, know, you, you, you get you, somebody bumps into you in their car, get you a fender bender. And it's not by chance. You know, you meet somebody one day you're out shopping and some guy gives you a hard time. That doesn't happen by chance. You know, these, these things, they're all in God's plan. And he allows these things to take place so that... Uh, uh, Somewhere along the line, uh, our faith is worked on, and, and, uh, and we're tried, and he's constantly just trying to work things out for, for, our, for our good, to, to make us grow. Uh, that bad news you get from the doctors, and uh, you know, I was telling the, one of your boys, I, was, I got to go fishing yesterday for a few minutes, you know. And I went down down in the Shannon Creek, and I wanted to catch a couple of trout, and, and I'm walking there, and, and, and I had these hip boots on, and, and, and sometimes you bump in a rock, you know, and you you know you catch yourself. Well, this foot was forward, and I went to move, it got snagged on a little tiny rock about this big, and I started to go that way, so what do you do? You, you're going to lift that foot. But then when I went to lift it, it wouldn't go up, it was caught under that rock. I just, and then split second, I went forward, face first, and just water this deep. Got wet all over. And even in the boots, I'm just laying there. I just rolled. I mean, it's just unreal. <laughs> and and uh, so I fished there all wet there for a while. For the next two hours, I caught one trout. That was really worth it, huh? <laughs> and, and uh, but you know what? God knew about that. He could have avoided that happening, couldn't he? He could have had some certain guy come by and say, hey, you're catching anything and diverted me so that wouldn't happen. So, so why did it happen? Was it just bad luck? No, no there's no bad luck in, in this, in the, in, there's no bad luck anywhere and there's no such thing as chance. God, God knew about it. And uh, he said my steps are word of him. He wanted me to not get mad and angry about it. He wanted me to Somehow, uh, say praise the Lord, you know, and, and, uh, 
And you know, that would have took a little bit of a mature Christian to do that, huh? I ain't going to tell you what happened. But that would have took a, a really mature Christian, wouldn't it? And wouldn't you like to be able to, to grow so enough that, that when things like that happen, you, you, don't, you don't blow it and get angry and, and murmur and complain and, and pout? And, and how are we going to grow like that? Well, we have to have those trials along the way. And we have these convictions and the Holy Spirit working in us. And, and little by little, we, we, we uh, take on the weights of life. And as we grow, we, we get stronger and stronger until finally, uh, you know, things like that or catastrophes come and, and we just come through with flying colors. Uh, I think about, about uh, you know, how, how grandparents, they, they seem to just have, they, go, they can take a lot of trials. They, they have the ability to just, uh, when things go bad, they have the ability to just uh, trust God. And, and you say, gee, how's grandma and grandpa do that? Where they get such great strength from? Well, they got it from years of experience, didn't they? And, and God's been trying them for years and years. And, and, uh, and, and you know, it doesn't stop. The, the, the trying of our faith is more precious than gold. And, and for David, God put him in that wilderness of En Gedi to try him so that uh, uh, to prepare him to be a, a good king. And, you know, he was a good king. He was a God-fearing king and wrote all those psalms. And I thank God that uh, God put him through those trials because it, it benefits us today, doesn't it? His kingship went a long way. Uh, you know, even in chastisement, you know, even when we sin, God is good, isn't he? You know, isn't it amazing that he loves us even when we're sinners? I mean, while we're sinning, once you're saved, you know, he, he loves you with an everlasting love. And now he do not love my sin... And he's not happy with it when I sin. But I know one thing. His love doesn't diminish towards me when I sin. He still loves me as much as he did the day I got saved. And, and, uh, uh, and I can't comprehend that sometimes. But, uh, but I know God does. And, and I thank God for that. I thank God that uh, he uh, loves us with an everlasting love. I, I thank God that even in chastisement, he's good. You know, what, one thing he does in chastisement is... is uh, you know, it may, may be grievous, but, but God's got one motive on his mind. He, he hates that sin in our lives, and he wants to remove that sin. And so he'll spare no expense to, to remove that sin and, and get us set free from it. And, and, uh, and so uh, uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, in God's attribute of goodness... He's perfectly good. I'm glad that he doesn't show favoritism. I'm glad he doesn't favor some over me. You know, he doesn't show partiality. And, and his goodness doesn't know any compromise. It doesn't know, doesn't know any tolerations or exceptions. You know, he's perfectly good. And, uh, in, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, it says, for for everything, there's a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. And that purpose is always a purpose for good. You know, God, God's not a bad God. He's not like Allah or Krishna or these other gods that don't know mercy. He's a God that knows the cares and loves and, 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 and wants to impart mercy and, and justice. I'm glad that His mercies endure forever. I'm glad that His mercy, mercies are new every morning. There's no ending to, to God's goodness. You know, and, and, uh, and that's something we can, we can hold on to. God is perfectly good. There's no badness in him. You know, David had his in Gedi, and, and uh, Joseph had his Egypt. Job, Job had his sufferings. I like what Job said. He says, you know, though he slay me, yet I'll trust him. You know, he somehow, he, by faith, he was able to look beyond his trials and, and, and see that God was working in his life. And when he didn't understand it, he didn't go by a human measuring stick. He went by God's word and said, yes, God is good. I don't understand what's going on, but I'm going to trust him. And if he slayed me, I'll trust him. And Job was a guy who went through an awful lot. You know, we all know the story about Lazarus, how he died, you know, when God told him that he wouldn't die. And his two sisters, you know, they, they, they told Jesus, you know, they had a prophet's chamber for him. They were sisters and a brother. And, and, uh, and what happened was when, when he got sick, I wonder if that happened by chance, though, if he got sick, huh? 
Or did God order his steps that he'd get sick? Yeah, God orders his steps, didn't he? Because things don't happen by chance. And, and, then, and then when, when uh, uh, Jesus got the word that he's sick, you know, he, he said, don't worry, this sickness isn't unto death. And, you know, I've been satisfied. I've been comforted by that, wouldn't you? You know, you're sick and always like to be unto death because Jesus himself told you so. And then Jesus didn't show up and he got worse and worse until he finally dies. And, and now, now, and, and I can see Mary trying to be spiritual, saying, well, you know, he's going to come any moment like he did Jerry's his daughter. He'll raise him up. But he didn't come and four days go by and he stinketh and they buried him, huh? And, and then when he did come by, you know, I don't know if it was Mary or Martha, but one of the sisters said, Oh, Lord, if only you'd been here, you know, he wouldn't have died. And, and, and I, would, I, would have, I would have doubted the Lord a little bit, or maybe a lot, because he did give his word that he wouldn't die, and he did die, didn't he? I bet you maybe I would say, maybe he ain't really the Christ after all. Who knows? And, and the Bible says God's good, and he doesn't lie. And Jesus let Lazarus die after he said he wouldn't die. And, and, then, and then the Lord's answer was to, 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 to Mary. He says, you know, he says, don't you know that I'm the resurrection and the life? And, 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 and she had faith. Yeah, you're going to raise us up someday, she said. But what she didn't realize is he was life itself. And, and, and then when he did speak the words of life to Lazarus, and he came back to life after four days, wasn't that a miracle? Now let me ask you something. What do you think their faith was like after that? The next time he was speaking somewhere, maybe uh, on the Mount of Olives or, or somewhere around the Sea of Galilee or something, I bet you out of all the folks that were listening, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus got the most out of his messages because their faith was so, so much greater. And, and, and the same, same thing in our life. You know, God's working things out for our future. And... and uh, and we're supposed to be living by faith and not by sight. And, and, and faith tells me that when I don't understand things, God's still in control. And, and that's the way God wants to be. He wants to, us to know that He's always in control and, and nothing's happening by chance. And, and, and you know, our duty is to walk by faith and not by sight. Our duty is to submit ourselves to the will of God, no matter whether we understand it or not, and, and let Him have His way. And the next time you have heartaches in your life, delays, detours, sickness, bad news. You know, just just, just go by faith and, and, and trust God. And if you don't understand it, just submit yourself to, to the will of God. Know that all your steps are ordered of Him. And He says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And the Lord is good. And He says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. David learned a lot in that wilderness of the Getty that made him a great king. And God's preparing us right now, each one of us, for every step of our life. He's preparing these young folks for when they're going to be, be uh, young adults. He's preparing some of them so they can be a good wife and husband someday. He's preparing some of us for our middle age and some for the old age. He's preparing us for jobs in our life and tasks in our lives and ministries in our lives. And, and, and all along, God's, God's doing a work in our, in our lives. And who knows, maybe God's preparing somebody here to be a king. I don't know, but I'll tell you what. I'm just going to taste and, and see that God is good, and I'm going to trust Him at all times. So let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. Hands are bowed, our eyes are closed. And, uh, God, God, God's always working things out in our lives.